We've been waiting for Steve and he's arrived. Okay, so the short title for my talk is SIP, which stands for Structure Identity Principle. Um, so I'm going to talk about, well, no. Mathematicians talk about the, for example, additive group of integers. So the point of my talk is uh, to um, discuss this issue of Z. Um, I don't have that much to say, so uh, I could probably finish earlier than um, normal. But I'm happy, happy, very happy to have interruptions. Many of you are more expert in some aspects of what I'm going to be saying than I am. So if you think you've got something to add, or if there's something I d you don't understand that I'm saying, please interrupt. So I'm happy to have a bit of a discussion. Of course, if I feel I'm running out of time, I, I will um, stop the discussion, if, if there is one that starts. So uh, another example of the additive group would be uh, one might call 2z, where 2z is the set of even integers. And these are isomorphic structures. And therefore, they have the same structural properties. And so therefore, we don't want to be bothered to be concerned, usually, with which particular structure we take. Um, so that becomes the issue of what do we mean by a structural property? Well, in set theoretical mathematics, an example of a property that is not structural is to say what that one, um, which happens to be in the underlying set of this first structure, uh, saying that one is in here, uh, if we're thinking uh, in the set theoretical style, is not a structural property because one is not in 2z, even though the two structures are the same. Of course, there is a copy of one in here, but one itself is not in. So to say of an abelian group that the particular set theoretic object one we've chosen is in um, the underlying set of the structure is not a structural property. So some properties are structural and others uh, are not. Okay. Yes. Why don't we define a structural property to be one with respect to all the I'm going to discuss that in a, a, in a couple of minutes, probably. Uh, one in Z. Well, uh, 
this is understood in the set theoretical style of writing things. So one is a particular set theoretical object. Uh, all these things are particular set theoretical objects. Um, so one I've assumed to be, as I said up there, is in um, the first structure, but it is not in the second structure. That particular set theoretical object. Yeah, there is a copy of one in here by the isomorphism. But that's a different set theoretical object. So I want to distinguish between what I'm just going to call set mathematics, which I think of as the um, mathematics done in the language of something like ZF set theory, axiomatic set theory. I contrast that with type mathematics, which I think of as something like uh, the language of dependent type theory or possibly some kind of category theoretic language that you may prefer. So I'll, I'll use this, this terminology. So in, in uh, the SIP principle, structure identity principle, in set maths, we'll say is the principle which says isomorphic structures are structurally identical. Uh, I'm using the word identical here. Um, one could use the word equal, structurally equal. Uh, they have slightly different meanings, but um, anyway, I'll use Id structurally identical here. And what this means is that they have the same st structural properties. So the question becomes, what is a structural property? But before I get to that, there's the principle in type mathematics. which I want to say is that isomorphic structures are identical, i.e. they have the same properties. Have you, yes, I've removed the word structural. They simply have the same properties. Um, now, if one's focused on the set, set mathematics, then uh, this is obviously impossible. Um, but the miraculous thing is that in dependent type theory, uh, this strong form of the structure identity pr principle is not only possible, but one can prove theorems to this effect. So the last part of my talk will be a proof of a particular theorem um, to this effect. So but before I get there, there are various questions I want to be concerned with. Um, first question, what kinds of structures are there? Could you ask that question a little bit later? Um, it, it's sort of going to come up at, um, a little bit later. Uh, 
Uh, the second question, what is a structural property? Third question, what is a notion of structure? in set maths. And the final part, this theorem I mentioned, in hot, we're going to be using the univalence axiom, because the very simplest kind of structure one can imagine in type theory is the notion of type itself, just the type of objects. Um, uh, and the univalence axiom is saying something about that particular kind of structure, that uh, isomorphic objects, uh, sorry, isomorphic types are identical in the sense of propositional equality, propositional identity. Uh, so that's the very first step in a, a more general result one might hope to get. You have a question? Uh, yes, so going back to, to just to say, you, you said um, in, in type theory, uh, structure, or identical, or isomorphic structure does the same properties. But if you translate the, uh, the example you gave in uh, set theory, um, yep. I mean, that same thing isn't true in, in type theory, right? If you say that, like, one is an element, or one has type D, but one does not have type B, right? So, I mean, you can ask, like, at a judgmental level, right? You could be, it seems like in both settings, if you ask bad questions, you, you know, you fail at the property. Well, uh, if one tries to express this in type theory, this is not meaningful. Okay. Whereas in set theory, it's actually something you can express meaningfully. But it's not meaningful in type theory. And that's why we have the possibility of, of proving a theorem like this. So, so I want to say that there's some weakness with the set theoretical language um, which allows us to talk about, we talk about the additive group, but um, uh, using the word the there is somehow unfortunate or might, can be viewed as being unfortunate. And that weakness or unfortunateness of, of the language of set theory, you don't have the same weakness in, in dependent type theory. And so one can hope to prove a, a, a theorem uh, like what I want to show later on. OK, um, so these are the four parts of my talk. Uh, I'm only going to be focused on single sorted structures. Single sorted. Just for simplicity. Well, in contrast to many sorted structures, so uh, one is used to thinking of very often of single sorted structures, but for example, in computer science, generally the kind of structures one focuses on will generally be many sorted. 
There can be different sources. Sorry? Yeah, one can think of vector spaces over a fixed field, and that's single sorted. But if you allow the field also to vary, you have two sorts there. Okay. But um, so there's a whole dimension. Starting with single sorted, you can have many sorted, then you can have dependently sorted, and who knows what else you might imagine. And these will still be mathematical structures, surely. In, in, in some sense, and uh, one would hope uh, that something like the structural identity principle should hold for all of these kinds of different kinds of structures. So that's an, a dimension I don't want to get into, but it's an interesting thing to, to look at. Okay, so that's the plan. So first of all, um, let me go over here. Topic one, what kinds of single sorted structures are there? Well, logicians at least are used to first order, using first order languages to be able to express sentences giving properties of a first order structure. So a first order structure, uh, you have an underlying set, you have some distinguished individual elements of the set. You can have some function symbols, each having a number of argument positions, function symbols f, you can have relation symbols, um, and that's what usually makes up a possible first order structure. Uh, but you can also, um, well, uh, one possible generalization is that you can allow the function symbols or the relations, the functions or the relations, not to be just having taking finally many arguments, but possibly infinitely many arguments. And, and uh, I don't have an example offhand, but, but one can imagine uh, such a generalization. And that would be a perfectly good structure. And one would hope uh, that a structural identity principle would apply even to that. Um, so that's first order logic. Then you can go to second order logic. Uh, consider second order structures. Uh, typical examples would be vector sp sorry, topological spaces where uh, the topology is in the power set of the underlying set. Another example might be uh, complete lattices. where you have infantry operations operating on arbitrary subsets of the lattice. Uh, and one can imagine higher order structures um, and possibly even of transfinite order. And these uh, may not get used very often, but one, one can imagine them. And uh, uh, a structure identity principle should still apply. And there may be, a, a, in this kind of dimension, there may be other kinds of things one could imagine. So considering single sorted structures, the general idea is that you have a set and you have some structure on the set, uh, which you might want to encapsulate in a single object, a set with a structure on the set. And then uh, you might want a category of such things. So you want a notion of map between two of them. And the idea that is that a map between two of them should be a function on the underlying sets, which preserves the structure. And we all know that in particular cases, we have an understanding of what that means. Can I yes. There is another notion of structure coming from the category where you don't have the morphism determined by the object, but you have a kind of freedom in describing what the morphisms are. And that's a term of the notion of structure which can't necessarily be specified. 
Okay, so that's going to come up a little bit later. Yes. Preserving structure. So I mean, just there. The question is, uh, this is uniquely determined by the structure. What it means to preserve? It's not uniquely determined. Uh, that, that's part of what one, when one's considering a particular kind of structure. Uh, it's important becomes important from this perspective to say what you mean by preserving the structure and that will become clear when I give my uh, um, the account I want to show you uh, yeah yeah so um, what more do I want to say about this yeah. There's a system called Fault. That's not logic, but you call it Fault. Organized system. I want to stick to single sorted structures in this talk. Uh, that's a dimension I just don't want to get into. Uh, it would take up too much time, I think. Um, I've got some references which I've been interested to look at. First of all, one could ask the question, uh, where in the mathematical literature is this kind of topic discussed? Uh, what well, these kind of questions asked explicitly. Um, and a key place where it is discussed is Bulbaki in uh, the Elements of Mathematics, Theory of Sets, Chapter 4, is called structures, and they give a definition of what a structure is. And it becomes, it's important for them because uh, they, uh, the later books um, have a, a common theme of things called mother structures, uh, and they look at different kinds of structures. And they wanted, at the start of um, the elements of mathematics, to um, say precisely what they meant by a structure. And uh, they give a definition in a few pages. It's very obscure to read if you read it for the first time. You have to look at it a bit closely for a bit. Um, but the reality is what they do there is never really properly used. Uh, it's lying there at the beginning of the whole series of volumes um, and um, not really used. Uh, so, in a sense, um, their approach to structure was a bit of a failure, and one could argue that the category theoretic approach has been the successful uh, alternative approach to talking about structures. I've looked at one or two historical books about this. I, I think I've just mentioned some references. So, first of all, Bulbaki. There's a rather nice book, I think, by Corrie called Modern Algebra and the Rise of Mathematical Structures. Uh, it's published in 1996. So you can easily find this if you Google. Uh, uh, another book um, is by a chap called Cromer. Um, 2007, which I think is quite nice. It's about the history and philosophy of category theory. So if you haven't been aware of this, you may find it of interest. It's called Tool, Tool and Object. I have, uh, at the moment, uh, all three of these things out of the library, uh, not all of them are in the library here. Um, so I got this from the Princeton Library. I, I didn't think to look at that. I, um, I 
Do you remember the title? Okay. Um, so it's, well, I won't give it a try. Yes, I've been aware of some papers he's written. I don't think I've looked at the book. Another thing I should mention is the notion of concrete category, which I'll be saying more about. Um, and so there's a literature on that. In particular, there's a book by Adamek, Herrlich, and Strucker called Concrete Categories, um, which uh, I found useful. And again, if you Google, which I did, I guess, for the first time this morning on concrete categories, there's interesting stuff to read, which I haven't taken account of yet. OK. Structuralism? Uh, yes, right. Uh, because uh, I'm thinking that anthropology really starts, the anthropology is so uh, saturated uh, in uh, uh, views of uh, different cultures and uh, it was influenced by a view of uh, Andrew Dale, who was mm. one of the members yep. of the I think Bourbaki came first, and structuralism in anthropology and other subjects came after, I believe. After Bourbaki. After Bourbaki, yeah, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think so. But under mm. the influence of Dale, apparently Dale was sort of explaining or uh, discussed, uh, really sprout got uh, the idea of structuralism, abstract idea, from Dale. Yeah. Really, I didn't know that. That's uh, what I got uh, years ago. From How do you spell? Andre Vale. Uh, is it I E or E I? Yeah. Yes, uh, um, the Bourbaki version that one sees, sees today, I think, first was presented in 1957, although it had been under discussion for many years before that. I think even from the 1930s, it was already being discussed. Um, Yeah, yeah, I would imagine so, yeah. I mean, an earlier note is Archie Wright, where there's a paper by Archie and Lindenbaum, where they show that isomorphic structures have all of the same static bounds, same numbers, and numbers. And this yes. requires defining the notion of a structure or a isomorphism of structures and so on. I must confess, in, in connection with my thoughts here, I haven't looked at that paper, Here's although, it, sorry, the first? That may be worth mentioning. Yeah. 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 So possibly Bourbaki was aware. Well, maybe not. But yeah, yeah. Might have been. No, but uh, we're we're I haven't looked at that, I'm afraid. I, I ought to Very get hold of that. Only the students of Erichman were able to read that. Well, Bulbaki is also, on structures, is also um, not very transparent. But yeah, it's, but it's uh, much more, it's more readable. Yeah. OK, uh, let me get to the next topic. 
Perhaps I should do this fairly quickly. So topic two, what is a structural property in set mathematics? So one might give the answer as, as I forget who, maybe it was Steve, uh, a structural property is simply a property preserved by isomorphism. Now that's, then the structural identity principle becomes a tautology, so it's a useless definition. Okay? <laughs> um, the fact is that we intuitively recognize when a property is structural or not. If we, if we see a property of some kind of structure, we can see it's structural or not, if we have a little bit of um, experience of doing mathematics. Um, the point is that uh, a property is structural if it's given only in terms of what's given by the structure, by the, by the ingredients of the actual structure. And, and we can just see whether, you look at the definition of a property, you can see if it's structural. But there's more details one could give there's the answer of logicians. Um, that, that's something like that, yeah. I'm trying to express how we intuitively go about recognizing that a property is structural. One is a. If we're thinking, if. If we think of the role of one in as a, as a structural thing, then we're not thinking of one in the set theoretical sense, as a particular object of set theory. Um, so it's a little bit subtle to uh, say what's going on. So I want to say that the logicians have an answer. Or in a sense, they have many answers. Uh, so if a logician takes a first order language. So if we take a logical lang a language that logicians use to talk about structures, then it's a fact that we can define a property of a structure A. So if A is a structure for a logical language L, so the language L may have uh, symbols for individuals, symbols for functions, symbols for relations, um, if we define a property um, of, such a, of a structure for the language to be that A is a model of T, where T is a set of sentences of the language, then this will be a structural property because uh, if the language has been set up, if the logic has been set up properly, it, there will be an isomorphism theorem saying that any sentence true of one structure, so, uh, so there's the iso theorem for the, language, for the logic, um, uh, If you have two structures A and B uh, and phi a sentence of the language, then uh, what's true for A will also be true for B. So there's a standard theorem 
and a logician introduces a new logic, perhaps, um, to, to have sentences that can talk about the structure. And we define a property like this, where T is a set of sentences of, of the language for, this, for that structure. This will be a structural property because of the isomorphism theorem. And logicians have introduced many kinds of languages, first order languages, higher order languages, um, infantry languages. And in each case, you will have an isomorphism theorem, and you could use those languages, which can be more and more expressive, uh, to formulate structural properties. So that's the way a logician might come to uh, express in precise terms um, our intuition about um, structural properties. It can involve, so the sentence can involve constant symbols which name elements of A. And then, of course, there's the category, cate category theoretic answer. Well, presumably category theorists, which I'm not, can express the answer better than me. But here's my way of saying it. In a category of structures, internal identity of objects is isomorphism which may be different from external identity. So there, there will be an internal language of some kind for talking about properties of the objects of a category, um, if it's a category of structures, um, then the only sensible notion of identity relative to the language we're using to talk about objects in, in, a, in a category of structures uh, that's the internal language. Um, the only sensible notion of equality between the objects um, will be isomorphism. Perhaps I'm not saying that perfectly. Um, so the external identity is um, any kind of meta theory for, or general theory, mathematical th theory we're talking about one category or another category, where um, objects which um, may be isomorphic, you can see that they're different externally. Okay, so I, I won't say any more about that, but, but there is a category theoretic answer. Does anyone want to give a better expression of it? Identity between objects, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, in the internal s sense, um, you don't have any notion of equality, one categorist to, to say. Uh, all one can do is have isomorphism. Yeah.
<laughs> okay, so as my talk progresses, it gets more mathematical. Um, so the third topic, uh, what is the notion of structure in set mathematics? So I'm going to start with looking at set mathematics, um, where things are a little easier for me, at least. Um, so. so, the definition. Keep in mind, I'm just focused on single sorted structures. If Px is a set for each set x, h, so the intuition is that Px is the set of structures on x. So I've already said, talked about adding a structure to a set, or putting a structure on a set. So Px will be the set of things that one might add to a set to form a structure. Hxy alpha beta f is a proposition uh, which intuitively expresses that f is structure preserving. where x and y are sets, alpha is in px, beta is in py, and f is a function from x to y. We're, we're, we're concerned with expressing what we mean by um, a certain kind of structure. A notion of structure. Before a fixed set of things that are presented before, the C is the F to R. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. So you're saying it is a, in the science of a description of a structure. You're talking about, you're defining a, a notion of a description of a So obviously, some axioms should hold for this setup. Such that, uh, usually I will omit the, these, these superscripts. The identity map is always structure preserving. Secondly, you can co compose structure preserving maps. I will introduce the notion of a concrete category in a moment, and uh, then there's the issue of relationship between the notion of a concrete category and this notion of a uh, kind of structure, species of structure. Um, I, 
I've said I'm happy to have interruptions. Um, time is getting a little bit short. Yeah, I think I've still got, if, I, if I'm going to finish by 12.30 only, um, then I've still got plenty of time, I think. So um, that's enough for some purposes. But as we'll see for the part, fo part four, um, we need an extra property. So there's a word used for this extra property um, in the context of con the notion of concrete category. And I'm going to use that word here. It's amnestic. I have no idea where it comes from. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Let me give the definition. So I'll call this axiom three. By the way, this, sorry? So alpha and beta are, stru are both structures on, the s on x. It's, you're going to see the role it plays later on. Um, By the way, um, I have a vague memory from ages ago that I must have read something like this before, but I haven't the foggiest idea where I might have seen something like this before. Does anyone know? Um, I mean, I would be surprised if it's completely new with me. That's something I'm going to remark on in, in a bit. So uh, the next topic is to, is to talk about concrete categories. So a concrete category. a pair of things. So A is a category and U from A to sets is faithful. Which means it's injective on the home sets. And uh, where I got the, the word amnestic from, from the book by Adam X. Strecker and there's a third author, I've forgotten. This is amnestic. Well, maybe I can draw a picture. We've got the functor from A to sets. If we take a set, x, and take two, two objects up here lying above x, and two maps, f and g, which both go down to the identity, 
this, this implies that A equals B. Okay, so there's a theorem that uh, given any notional structure, PH, you can define, a con you can associate a concrete category. So, uh, so let A be the sigma category. Um, Thank you, yes, that's a mistake. I don't want to use alpha and beta here, uh, but, but, um, but here. Um, so you get a category A whose objects are pairs X alpha and whose maps are, are functions on sets, on the sets, underlying sets, which um, preserve the structure given by, by uh, H. So given any PH, you get a category of structures, such pairs, with ma um, structure-preserving maps. Um, and this is obviously a concrete category according to the definition. Uh, the, the you just forget the structure and you get the underlying set. Just projection. Uh, and uh, this, this concrete category, category will be amnestic if and only if um, this third property holds. Yeah. So H is expressing that it preserves the structure. Yeah. So, so, um, and and the final point is that if you take any concrete category, it's isomorphic to one obtained from a notional structure. Okay, so this notion of concrete category corresponds to what you can get from uh, this notion of structure. Up to isomorphism.
So this conclusion f equals g, is that correct? It follows from the having a equals b, that therefore f must be equal to g. Okay. Um, I need to think about that. <laughs> okay, so I've got about half. Sorry? I didn't hear that. Okay, so I've got sort of 26 minutes left if I finish at 12.30. And I'm coming to the most mathematical part of my talk where I go to homotopy type theory. Okay. I'm going to be using the univalence axiom, but um, I'm only going to use a weak consequence of the univalence axiom. So I want to state what that is, first of all. So, get, so now A and B are types, and... Uh, I want to say what I mean by isomorphism or whatever the right word to use is between two types. So um, I think I'm going to use logical notation rather than uh, type theoretic notation sometimes. Uh, A is isomorphic to B if there's a function from A to B and a function G from B to A such that F composed with G is the identity on B and G composed with F is the identity on A. I'm going to abbreviate this with A iso uh, A isomorphic f comma g b and I'll abbreviate this with a isomorphic f b okay so just a bit of notation and I'm going to use u for a type universe Um, by recursion on, on the identity type on U, so the elimination rule for U, we can define, well, I, I won't say define, there is FABP function from A to B for A and B and U and P proof object that A equals B we can diff that we know that there is such a thing such that This is equal to the identity on A for A in U. And this is the proof of reflexivity. Given by the definition of what one means by the identity type. <coughs> so this is the introduction rule for the identity type on U. Yeah. 
Yes. This, this is R subscript A. Um, in informal type theory, this is called reflection subscript A. Okay, so this is just simply an instance of the elimination rule for um, uh, identity types or path types. Same as ring pass, but in the case of these little universes, instead of mass, which means it's like some type that ever exists. And moreover, that mass has has that mass has nothing is the identity. Okay, is that So if I'm looking at the, the path type on, on a universe, this is the simplest, possibly the simplest application of the elimination rule for a path. This is nothing to do with univariance so far, but it's... I'm afraid if I keep at this speed, I'm not going to finish by 12.30. So if you're keen on lunch, <laughs> you um, uh, let me press on. So moreover, by what I choose to call IDU induction, we can prove that for all f from a to b, if f equals one of these things, then f is an isomorphism from a to b. B in U and P proof of A equals B. So again, you, you prove this by simply identifying A and B and letting P be the proof of reflexivity and check that this becomes, because uh, in that case, F becomes the identity. A and B are equal, so it's just the identity, F becomes just the identity map which is obviously an isomorphism. Okay. Now, if U is univalent, then we get the following holding. If we, if we have F being an isomorphism from A to B, that implies that there is a proof of equality such that 
this is true. That's an immediate, more or less immediate application of univalence. Let me not stop to, ch to try and persuade you of this, but just accept this. And this is what I call weak univalence. So I call you weakly univalent if this property always holds. And that's all I'm going to need. So now I have to uh, talk about this notion of structure, but now in type theory. So now we have Px is, um, is a type for each x in u. So we're looking at a notion of structure on the universe. So Px is going to be, really remember, the type of structures on a type in u. Now this is A Okay, so I hope this all makes sense now in type theory. Okay. So, so now we have the notion of the. Do I have that? Um, yes, I've forgotten. For my purposes, I just need this to be a type for the purposes of this talk. If you look at the chapter on, on uh, category theory in the book, the informal presentation of homotopy type theory we're working on, um, there is the theorem I'm about to give, but in a more restricted context. So what has interested me is to get a more general result than is actually in the book at the moment. Yes? So where are we? Does that answer your question?
So this is a type, and when I simply assert it, I'm saying that it has a proof. Sorry, yeah. So when I assert this type, I'm simply it's a shorthand for saying there is a, a t an object in this type. The type is inhabited. OK, I'm almost reaching the stage of stating the theorem of I want to prove. If we've got two of these structures, I want to define what this means of them being isomorphic. There's a function from A to B and G from B to A such that the underlying types are isomorphic by F and G. But also F and G preserve structures. So H, alpha, beta, F, and H, beta, alpha, G. Okay, so the theorem states that if U is weakly univalent, and PH is an am amnestic. notional structure then for pH structures a alpha b beta if they're isomorphic, that implies they're equal. OK, so that's the result. Yes, this will form a concrete category if I were to give the definition. I would prefer not to. Um, I do want to try and finish at 12.30. Uh, uh, if you're not getting hungry, I, I am. Uh, <laughs> um, So we've got to show that if A alpha is isomorphic to B beta via the two functions F and G, inverses of each other, 
that implies a alpha equals b beta. By weak univalence, it's enough to show by weak univalence, this f must come from a, a proof of an equality that A equals B. So it's enough to show the following. For all F from A to B, if F is obtained from capital F via a proof P, that implies all. So I have to write this out in a suitable way so that I can use the induction rule for identity on the universe. But all that implies... to assume that F and G preserve the structure. And then the conclusion is what, what I want to conclude, A alpha equals B beta. Um, to show four. So what are, what's free? A and B are free. So it's for A, B in U, and P a proof that A equals B. If one wants to use the induction rule for equality on the universe, we, we need to prove something of this form, that it, under these conditions, all that holds. So using the um, By using induction, it is enough to show, well, uh, so we can identify A and B, so replace B by A and replace P by the proof of reflexivity. So what do we get? For every f from a to a, if f equals the identity on a, now here we had f equals this, but when b becomes a and p becomes reflexivity, that is the identity. So I can put, replace that by the identity. Now we have for all g from a to a. If f composed with g is the identity on a, and that's also g composed with f, remember a and b are being identified, that implies and I'll call this star, 
that for every alpha and beta structures on A, if a H alpha beta F and H beta alpha G, that implies that A alpha equals A beta. So I'm simply applying the induction rule for, for identity. But it's enough to prove this. But if we're assuming f equals 1a, we can replace 1a here. And so we get from this that g is also equal to 1a. So both f and g are identities. So when we go down here, we can put 1a here and 1a here. And we know from the amnistic property, this implies that alpha equals beta. And these two structures have the same underlying type. And if alpha equals beta, that means the two structures are equal. That's the proof. Uh, some of you may have seen how the proof goes immediately from stating the theorem. Uh, so I, I thought it would be a good idea to do it in slow motion. And it's now 12.30. So let me state a conclusion. So my conclusion is univalence can provide new insights into the structural understanding of mathematics. Um, and I want to go on to one further thing which needs investigation, I believe. Um, the structures we've been talking about are somehow one-dimensional. What about two-dimensional structures? Um, such as the category of groups as a single object, as a structure. That category as a structure is somehow two-dimensional. And there should be a theory of um, such things up to equivalence instead of what we've been talking about, structures up to isomorphism. So I'd be interested to see how that works out and then go on to higher dimensions. OK, I'll stop there. <laughs> Except that um, I'm only using weak univalence, and I'm not, I don't have an understanding of the difference between univalence and weak univalence. It seems much weaker to me, because um, I'm only concerned with the structural identity principle, which is a logical implication, um, ra rather than getting a an equivalence between the two sides of the implications. 